Migraine Management and Therapeutic Tinting, and actually I had meant to change the title. It really should be, um, we're going to deal with migraine, seizure disorder, and uh, therapeutic use of color for acquired brain injury and traumatic brain injury. So uh, I was in there updating a bunch of things and really needed to update the title, but um, uh, we should have some fun with this one. And uh, I do have um, also the chat window open, so um, feel free to uh, uh, type away there. Okay. So, and I know this is, a, this is a special group in a positive way. I know sometimes people go special and I don't mean it that way. But um, if you typically put vision and color together and you ask a group of optometrists and say, does color affect vision? Uh, generally, the answer most of these would give you is no. Now, not in this group, okay? Um, and um, uh, uh, by the way, as a, as a quick aside to Colin, uh, I'm wondering if uh, Yosef might be one to fill the bill for one of the things we were talking about earlier today. So we can chat about that later, okay? I won't put you on the spot, Yosef, okay? All right, good. All right. But I think most people, most optometrists would probably say no or would downplay the role of color. Uh, I've been doing a lot of stuff with color, as some of you know, and um, been trying also to look for the science behind it. And I think, uh, and we have enough people from other um, uh, parts of the world. Uh, um, I, I'm not sure that this works. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, uh, the basic idea is uh, the baby's the good idea, the bath water is what you wash off of them. Uh, and um, while you're draining the tub, you want to make sure the baby doesn't go down with it. So um, uh, there's lots, lots of really good work out there about color, but I think sometimes we, not we, but people in general hear color. Um, and there's, there's an aversion to it. Uh, I, I can clearly say that uh, in, in some walks of optometry, if we say color, if we say, you know, the S word, you know, the one S Y N N X, X, um, um, essentially you, you'll get shut down uh, uh, and not taken seriously. So I, I think it's, it's important to look for the science with it and, and keep working through. So many people, uh, particularly on this call, are aware that a lot of the early work started with um, uh, Spittler and his book, The Syntonic Principle, um, starting and, and getting the, the theoretical constructs, writing the book in the 20s and 30s. And basically, he was looking at the effects of light and color on health. Was, uh, he was a contemporary of Skeffick, and not exactly in the, in the years, but, but pretty close. Um, and I, I think I would say from my own personal reading in this, there's far too much evidence and good neurological work, which now shows that many of the connections that Spittler hypothesized uh, do indeed exist. Many of the connections that, that Skeffington talked about and others talked about without the proof of it, the idea of a centering process, an identification process that went beyond some of the essential things or basic things that we talk about, like accommodation and convergence, all, all very critical uh, in this thing. And they were, they were pioneers. They had the idea, they had the insight, and the science uh, came later. So we know that um, things like uh, the jet lag phenomenon that there's a big aspect of uh, sunrise, sunset, and the circadian rhythms and light cycles having something to do with why we feel the way we do when we get off planes. Of course, none of us are doing that now, but um, hopefully we'll be, uh, be able to go back uh, and do that uh, safely in the not too distant future. There was some very interesting work. I found it interesting. I hate when people tell you you'll find this interesting, but I found it interesting on what's really the physiological day. Uh, they did some work with uh, uh, people where they took away timepieces. They were um, uh, they could turn lights on and off. They could go to sleep when they wanted and turn them on. But they were down in I, I think 
dugouts or caves, you know, big wide open areas so they didn't feel claustrophobic or anything and good air circulation that could control the temperature, etc. And that a person who chooses to basically go to sleep when they're tired and wake up uh, when you wake up and not artificially by light, uh, a sunrise or those kinds of things, that the day really stretches out to about 25 and a half hours. Um, um, maybe that's why we all feel so tired is, is we're getting up earlier than our body really is ready for us uh, to get up. There's a lot of work was done uh, in seasonal affective disorder, uh, color, mood work, um, uh, the, the treating with lights. Um, many of you are too young. Uh, of course, uh, um, the only two with their videos on, Joseph and, and Ruth, uh, uh, <laughs> smile when I say maybe you're too young. But there was, a, there was a television show on for a number of years, and it was called Northern Exposure. And this group was up in Alaska. Uh, and um, one, of the, one of the young ladies was sort of a hippie, and she married a, an, an older guy. And um, it, it was an interesting relationship. I think her name was Shelley. But at one point in Alaska, they were, I don't know if they were in that part north of the, um, uh, you know, the, where you have a night uh, the whole year round. I don't know if they were that far north, but it was close. So there's obviously a phenomenon there and they worked it into the, um, uh, into the show, the seasonal affective disorder. And what was Shelley's um, uh, solution? had little clip-on lights that went onto the side of her husband's glasses and her glasses uh, and they would come on uh, about the time that they should get up and they would keep them on until just before the time they would go to sleep and they felt better. So I just thought it was interesting that somebody worked that into the actual uh, television show. Uh, we do know that the optic nerve has some of the connections uh, to pituitary via some of the nerve fibers and um, in other presentations I've given, we talk about the nine other branches of the optic nerve that go to other places other than uh, the lateral geniculate. Um, and it is some of these connections are the critical ones for regulating a lot of the things uh, that we see with light. So it's hard to go through the whole history of everything, but my early experience in practice uh, back in the Baltimore area uh, was with the Roscoe Lux filters. Um, these are theatrical lighting gels, and um, it was suggested to me to get a, um, uh, this book. And this was a each of these were eight and a half by 11 sheets. Uh, it was a three ring binder. There were well over 200 of these. And uh, what you see here is a page from that binder. Um, this was number 92 turquoise. It says the transmission of this was 59%, meaning it absorbed 41%. And I thought it was interesting that actually to light a stage, theatrical lighting gels, Again, you have these great big lights that light the stage. And if you have spent any time around the stages, they don't just have stark white light. Uh, they have these color filters or gels that are in front of them. Um, I never quite understood why somebody who was going to light a stage needed to know the exact wavelengths and exact transmissions. But I was very thankful for the fact that Roscoe Lux, when they put these together, um, uh, had these transmission um, uh, curves uh, there. Um, my philosophy uh, had been, and it was, look, it was around this time, I uh, was listening to many people. I had attended my first uh, uh, College of Syntonics and Optometry meeting when it was held in the Washington, D.C. area. Many of us from the D.C. area went and uh, took the courses and uh, uh, really learned about it. Um, and um, I, I, you really started to look at this. And I did not have a syntonizer uh, at that time. Uh, and um, there was no such thing as an intuitive colorimeter or any of these things at this point. 
So I started working with these filters. Um, and I had patients come in who'd had uh, a concussion, uh, uh, whiplash injuries. These were the primary ones that I was working with in my practice where they could not be in a room. <laughs> uh, the first two patients I worked with were patients who came in wearing two pairs of wraparound sunglasses, a baseball type cap, and a hoodie. Okay, I mean, they might have might as well been um, uh, the, the <laughs> uh, poster person, I won't say child, but for um, um, a hacker or something like that, because they certainly look the part. Uh, and, um, but they, when I, when they came to me and I was supposed to examine them, <laughs> they, they couldn't even, I, I couldn't even turn lights on. Um, and some of them we had to go, they could be in sort of natural light. Uh, so I'd be in a room, we'd slightly open the blinds and I could look at their eyes. Um, but lights and pupil testing and even retinoscopy, I tried at the lowest settings. Uh, I, I couldn't access them uh, through that. They could look at a chart, but even then you turn a chart on and it was... So part of this for me was working with these filters to, at the, in the beginning, just see what happened. And uh, we would do sort of a forced choice thing. I think this was around the time some of the work of uh, Erlen uh, was, was coming out and people were becoming aware of it. But I would have them, I would take the filter out, have them hold it up, and maybe there'd be a, a, a the door would be cracked with light out in the hallway. And I have them look out towards the hallway and basically give me their subjective feel as to how they could work with one color uh, or another. And you see this page here, uh, let me switch over to the uh, laser pointer, it's a little easier to see. This page here is cut. What this means, uh, I brought my book, my actual book of the Roscoe Lux filters with me to SCO. This means somebody at some point in my optometric career positively responded to this color. And my very first step was I would cut the filter out, cut them to match their glasses, put a little tape on the top and tape on the bottom and just have them wear it for a few days and give me a reaction to... Um, what did this do for you? So it wasn't an expensive option where I was um, having their glasses tinted or I was trying to tint their glasses or contact lenses. You'll see where I uh, head with this over time. So this was my early play with this, uh, if you will. So I, I'm going to jump way ahead to now September of 2010, I make the move to Southern College of Optometry. And I walk in and not the day I walk in, but within the first six months or so, uh, Dr. Mark Taub says, I need help with a case. Uh, and I, I think we'll, let's do a little case-based stuff. Um, but know that I had been in my private practice use, using the Roscoe Lux filters. When I found a significant filter that helped, I was actually doing some custom tinting of soft contact lenses for the patient. We're gonna to get to that, you'll see. Uh, what we do, but I, I don't think I need to tell the whole early story, but I was tinting contacts in the practice since probably about the mid-1990s. Um, so this case, former deputy chief of Memphis police, uh, not the actual head honcho, but um, second in line. Currently, when he came to me, he was, <laughs> he was the head of cyber security for FedEx. FedEx is, um, um, we all, I think you all know what FedEx is. Uh, their headquarters are in Memphis, Tennessee. So there's a ton of people, ton of facilities. This is where the planes come in. Um, even though Memphis now is a relatively small uh, airport in terms of the number of people that come through there, there's actually more cargo, I think, that comes in and out of Memphis on a daily basis because this is the main FedEx hub. At least three times a day, planes come in, planes go out. Planes come in, planes go out. Uh, and it's interesting uh, to see, and there's the facility for mixing everything around. So he comes in in the typical two sunglasses, ball cap, and a hoodie. Um, 
He'd suffered for the last several years with these debilitating headaches if he was anywhere near fluorescent lights for more than 15 minutes. I already mentioned how he came in. So he came to SCO. He was first seen by Mark Taub. Mark did the testing, and I'm going to show you the intuitive colorimeter, at least the version we had. And then I'm going to show you what replaces it. Uh, and hopefully you'll all stay on because it's open access. You're going to have free reign to use it. Uh, and um, there's no charges or anything like that. So I'll show you how to work through that as we um, as we go through. But Mark had come up with this color for him based on his response to the intuitive colorimeter. And basically he gave it a great big shoulder shrug. Didn't really help. And that's why Mark wanted me to jump in. This is the uh, first version of the intuitive colorimeter. Um, uh, Arnold Wilkins and Peter Allen and the group in the UK. Um, uh, and uh, Ruth can correct me if there's any others that need to be credited, but I think those are the main two. Uh, and, um, and essentially, um, it's a basic device that has two, two wheels uh, or two things you change. There's a the great big outer wheel here, and as you rotate it, uh, it moves through color space, and I'll explain what I mean. And there's a saturation button. It's not a wheel. This little orange thing, you push it one way, push it the other way, and you can change the saturation. Um, the problem is all of the numbers on this device are proprietary. They mean absolutely nothing uh, in terms of any standard color protocols. Uh, even the 30%, 50% numbers on the saturation are not even general suggestions as to what those numbers are. Uh, and certainly the number on the large spinning wheel has nothing to do with actual wavelength, though you're changing through dominant wavelengths with it. So uh, this is the basic device uh, or the schematic. You have a light, uh, condensing lens, uh, a surface, you have the filters. It bounces off here and onto um, there's a little platter that you can pull in and out. You can put text on it or nothing or nonsense. And the person looks down at it. Um, so it's an indirect viewing of the light spilling onto uh, something down there. And this is your standard color space. Um, these are standard uh, types of uh, diagrams uh, or transmission curves at different uh, points. Um, all the way out is uh, solid color. All the way in the center, uh, you have white. So I, I thought it would be interesting. I'm just going to show you. This is a, a quick video uh, that I did pointing in the device. This is nonsense words. Don't worry if you can or can't read them. But what I've done here is very slowly uh, turn the color wheel so that you could see the different colors as we go through. Is the video showing OK? Okay, good. So it's just to give you a sense, this is on one of the lighter settings and I'm very slowly turning the wheel just to give you a sense of what the colors are that are presented on here. And some of them you may go, ooh, I like that. And some of them you might go, ooh, change it fast. Um, but you get a sense of the actual colors. Uh, Ruth says also Bruce Evans, Jenny Falk, uh, and Arnold Wilkins. Yeah, Arnold Wilkins, I think, was the main one. And um, I ran into uh, Peter Allen that had done some uh, work with it uh, at Anglia Ruskin. But um, so Bruce Evans and Jenny Falk, just to give credit where credit's due. Thank you, Ruth, uh, for crowdsourcing for me. Okay. All right. So you got an idea of the colors. And they were very ingenious with this. Uh, remember, I said you have these wheels. On this wheel here, let me change over to the uh, laser pointer again. On this wheel here, there's a, a number. And this also, when you do this, there's a thing that slides forward and back and it gives you a number. So when you're done with your testing, they have a spreadsheet. And on this spreadsheet, there's two numbers. This is the hue is the number from the big wheel. Um, <laughs> Sounds like a, a, a car to ride. No, I'm kidding. Um, um, but the, and, and as I said, 360, that's not a wavelength. It's just a number on the device. Okay. 
it, it means nothing uh, compared to color world. Um, and saturation is 30. That's a number that's on their uh, system. But if you put the 360 and the 30 in that you got from there, this over here is showing the actual transmission curve of the light that was being splashed down onto the, the, um, the text or whatever target you had in there. And in an ingenious way, I'll come back to this, they had a set of, uh, in essence, index lenses, basic colors. Uh, I put one from each of the um, uh, fundamental colors, a rose, an amber, uh, a green, a sort of an aqua, and a purple, and then you have neutral density grays. And for each one of them, um, well, here's your, your official names, purple, blue, turquoise, green, yellow, orange, and rose. And there are, are up to five and in some six different um, uh, uh, depths of color or, or saturations. And in essence, what this is saying is to match this curvature, grab these four lenses, uh, and the lenses would be the orange one marked A5, the rose one A6, C4, and D3. So there's two of every lens in the set. You could take them, put them together, and have the patient actually hold them up and look out across the room. And the way I do the, did the testing when I was following this protocol is um, uh, I typically have the light on in the far half of relatively large room. How does that feel? If, it, if they're okay with it, I'll turn the full lights on. And then if they're okay with that, um, uh, we had a, a, a window that would open out onto, uh, we're up on the sixth floor where we do the testing at uh, SCO. And then they could actually look out um, on the outside uh, from there. So one of the things I can say is absolutely um, this curve matches the curve and the light that was in the device. I've used our uh, spectrometer to check the light that's actually produced in the device, to check the light through these filters. Um, they've done a brilliant job. Everything matches. And if you send away for the, um, uh, the specific tinting done by um, uh, the company that deals with this intuitive colorimeter and they come back, you put it on the spectrometer, it matches. So, I, I mean, they've done a very nice job uh, with making sure that a particular set, 360 and 30, is reproducible. And you can see, by the way, this saturation 30 just happens to come out to a 36% transmittance. Um, so it's off by 6%, but it's, it's, as I said, it's just a number. These were the filters, and this was how I did it uh, for a while. So the basic thing uh, I would do is, in the beginning at Southern College of Optometry, uh, we found a lab in the United States that was certified by um, um, uh, Cerium. That's the company that, that does it. And um, we would have them tinted. Um, they were expensive, but again, they did quality work and it matched when it came back. Um, this was in my practice. This was the um, soft contact lens tinting system I had used in my practice. And when we got, when I got to Southern College of Optometry, um, um, they uh, graciously ordered a trial set or, or a set of the tints and the dyes. These are just some starter dyes and this kind of thing. Now there's no need to write this down or even try to capture the screen because this company went out of business. Um, but this is the system I started with, uh, tinting soft contact. So this is what I had when I did um, the security guide for FedEx, cybersecurity. And the first thing I tried actually was a, um, <clears throat> so I redid the test thing and, but, and he needed dark and he needed really dark, okay? Um, I tried the Roscoe Lux filters and we went to the darkest filters and um, if you saw those sort of blue green glasses, they were, they were at about a 56% transmission, uh, 40, 
This contact lens, when I put it on the spectrometer, um, this one was only about 92% absorption, 8% of the light going through. Uh, and this was not dark enough for him. It was the center only. I thought it would look a little scary to have the whole thing dark, okay? And uh, by the way, he said, nope, that's not enough, center only. So I went, um, and what you see here is um, one of my first attempts at the whole thing. Uh, you can still clearly see his uh, iris and pupil through that. That was not dark enough. Um, this is what I had to go with. You can have a good laugh. It looks like a scary movie kind of thing. Um, this only lets 4% of the light through. Uh, and uh, this is a little video of uh, the contacts on, uh, the soft contacts, just so you could see how it moves. And uh... And I get a little sense of the uh, pupil in there but it's a dark, dark lens, okay? Now, first of all, you might ask right away, could he see through it? It's like, yeah, 2020 acuity, no problem. Uh, and as long as he was in uh, daylight hours or lit office, uh, there was also enough contrast for him. Um, uh, certainly he would take these out uh, to drive home if he was driving home at night and he did not wear these around the house. Uh, once he got home, but he still had to keep the lights relatively dim. So these lenses changed this man's life. Uh, basically wrote to me and said, uh, hope this email finds you well. I want to give you a brief update on the tinted contacts you made um, uh, for me. They're working extremely well. They've changed my life in a positive way. I can now work without having to wear my sunglasses. Um, he was afraid, by the way, they were going to let him go uh, because you know, are you just for drama? Uh, you're the cyber security guy. Are you dressing like this, you know, two sunglasses, ball cap and a hoodie? Um, uh, if he had to take meetings in other people's offices, I, I think you get the idea of how difficult this was. With those contacts on, he could freely move about the FedEx uh, complex, go through meetings and he went home and he was comfortable. Um, he saw well, he could do his job, uh, and this helped keep his job. He was actually concerned that FedEx was going to let him go uh, because they were, the main concern was, is the way you look getting in the way of you actually being able to do your job and have others take you seriously? Um, <laughs> an HR person would probably have fun with that and uh, look at the legal sides of it, but, you know, that's... Uh, um, that wasn't for me to work with. So it was nice to uh, have that um, uh, work. So let's look at some standard uh, patients and then some other applications that pushed me to go further. So patient AW comes into the SCO clinic with reading problems and demands color testing. They'd actually contacted Cerium uh, in the UK and got a referral to SCO. Cerium keeps track of where their devices are. So we did a full binocular evaluation in VT first and basically felt low plus and possibly VT was all this patient needed. I think most of you are aware that um, in the 90s when Erlen's work was first coming out, Mitch Scheiman uh, did some really fantastic work where they had a woman, um, uh, I think she was probably a vision therapist, but she had reading training background, they actually sent her to get um, uh, the Erlen training uh, and the Erlen testing system and this kind of thing. And eventually they published, um, um, I don't know if it was one or two papers, but essentially what they found was if you're just looking at reading close to everyone, I know it's probably not 100%, but those who were their reading was improved by a either color filter or a color overlay. What they found was a need for plus at near and a, that they had a binocular problem, um, a convergence insufficiency, convergence excess, accommodate, 
a general binocular dysfunction. And that when the general binocular dysfunction was addressed and the appropriate plus at near was applied, and then you retested them, they now no longer needed nor benefited from uh, the color. Um, and that, that was sort of proof positive, if you will, for many of us that um, for looking just at reading performance, um, we had a, a better, easier answer, if you will, uh, than going down this color route. At least many of us in the States, that's, that's a, a decision. And I will just tell you personally, unless my arm gets really, really twisted, and it was in this instance, uh, I have zero interest personally in testing on color to help improve reading specifically. Um, uh, mostly because we, again, we know we find the binocular problem in the plus and that's generally all that's necessary. Um, this parent still wanted the color testing done. These were the specific filters uh, from the set once we found them for her. Um, this was one of the early spectrometers um, uh, and uh, just putting the lenses in and just basically showing you that the curves matched what we found on the on the um, uh, on the intuitive colorimeter. And these colors, when you push them all together, these were her glasses. These were actually made by the uh, Cerium approved lab. Um, in the States, we, uh, there was a time they had to be sent to the UK, but uh, there is a lab in uh, Texas, at least uh, 2010, 2013, up to 2014, that we were sending lenses to. Um, and again, um, uh, I could take my four lenses, put them in the spectrometer, get a, get a curve. I could take the lenses that came back from their lab and they matched. They, they did a really wonderful job with it. Um, in some cases, now the device, the uh, colorimeter, at least the early version that I had, the, the saturation number 30 is this lighter and there's a 50 setting, which is supposed to be the dark, but for a lot of the cases like the um, uh, cybersecurity guy, and I needed one that was like 96, 98%, um, they, that machine doesn't go dark enough. And the Roscoe Lux filters definitely do. Now this was the green filter you saw that I had cut before. We get the pattern uh, and it just matched really nicely. So here is one of my SCO students. You can see her uh, with the same uh, girl that had the, the reading thing. Um, this is exactly in the phase of when I cut this out and tape them onto her glasses, just as a trial. Follow her down uh, a ways, uh, our student here. Um, this was so helpful. She said as soon as she had, as a third year student, gone into our clinic, um, that it was all she could do to get through the clinic day. And when she went home, she just sort of collapsed and just had to go to sleep. And the next day, if she was in clinic all day, it was do it all over again. No ability to study or read or, or practice anything. Uh, she just would end up with a migraine. Um, once we got the color on her, um, uh, it pretty well stopped her migraines and she could go home, take the color off and um, study and, and, and do things. So very quickly, once we found that the, that the um, filters you see helped her, I shifted to making tinted soft contacts for her. After she graduated, I made them for several years. She went into military optometry um, and there must have been some change for her. Maybe she's just able to completely avoid fluorescent lights. Um, uh, but she's needed less and less color. Uh, and eventually now, um, I think we're about six or seven years out from her graduation. She's not needing the color at all anymore, which was very nice for her. So I want to go to another case. Um, this was a woman who worked at SCO recently, only recently has uh, uh, left SCO, not faculty, uh, a staff person. So she had a history of migraine and seizures secondary to multiple 
uh, traumatic brain injuries. She began riding horses at the age of two, did not wear um, helmets, fell or from or was thrown from horses often. Uh, she said, well, my first concussion was probably somewhere between the age of four and five. And by the age of 12, I know I had at least six to eight concussions. Um, during this time, she'd have what the pediatrician called convulsions, sometimes spells. Uh, but he said they must have been from overheating. Uh, didn't really understand what was going on. 2004, she had a brain bleed, possibly secondary a car accident that happened earlier in the week. Most likely it, it probably did. Um, to try to deal with all of these, the, she was having both migraines and seizures. Um, they tried um, medications like Trileptol, but she was allergic to it. Keppra, this didn't work. Uh, they added Lyrica and uh, her actual dosage uh, that was stabilizing thing was 150 milligrams of Lyrica a day and 3,500 milligrams of Keppra per day. She'd been on those meds for about five years and that had stopped her grand mal seizures uh, and her last petit mal seizure was in July of 2013. Now she got auras on a regular basis, uh, eight to 10 a week actually. And the auras would always precede an event which could be either a seizure or a migraine. She would get visual tunneling. During the aura, she can't hear. She does not respond to auditory queries. She smells rubbing alcohol, even though there's no alcohol around. She tastes, has a taste in her mouth of metal. She would make noises and have some jerky physical movements typically lasted 20 to 30 minutes and her head would feel like it was in a vice. Fluorescent lights seemed to be trigger for the auras. And when she would have these, about 10% would go to nothing. 80% um, would turn into these migraines and 10% she would have seizures. So when I played with the intuitive colorimeter with her, I found that the big wheel at 240 and between 30 and 50 worked pretty nicely. I even played and fine-tuned sort of between uh, the cracks and found 225 was even better than the 240 on the setting. Uh, the Roscoe Lux filter showed middle blues, maybe with a hint of green were better. So decided to try glasses uh, and then sh if that helped, go to the contacts. So uh, here were her numbers. Um, and here you can see, uh, again, let me switch to the uh, laser pointer. At the um, 50 saturation, this is really transmitting only 19%. So it's actually an 81% uh, saturation type of thing. So I'm just trying to give you a sense that these numbers don't really mean much. And this 225, you can see the peak at this wavelength is probably somewhere around 490 nanometers. So again, what this 225 means, I have no idea. It's just a proprietary number. Um, and we could do these with these four lenses. She really liked it. This is her and her glasses. Um, uh, a big smile, very positive reaction. And I sort of kicking myself um, that it took so long to get to the tinted contacts. One of the things that happened was she was already wearing soft contacts and I took her lenses with my tinting system, tried it and the, her lenses wouldn't take the tint. So I went through our contact lens department and um, uh, there's some compartmentalization, which we don't need to go into necessity, you know, of a great big clinic. And they took a long time to end up fitting her to get her comfortable and seeing right with a lens that I could actually uh, tint. Okay. And um, so it took almost six months to get her into these contacts. Okay. And um, they, they match pretty nicely, the glasses. She's outside here and you're getting a big reflection so you can't see her eyes. Uh, here you can see, uh, and um, uh, really a wonderful smile. And um, this, these lenses changed her life. So this was uh, her email. Uh, Good afternoon, Dr. Harris, I hope this finds you well. Want to give you a brief update. Um, 
They're working extremely well. They've changed my life in a very positive way. I can now work without having to wear my sunglasses. Um, I'm not tired at the end of my work day due to the exposure to fluorescent lighting, and I can actually read after work without my reading glasses. After, and uh, after I take the tinted contacts out, it's amazing. I thank you for what you've done for me. Um, um, two weeks later, she reported she had not gotten a single aura even. Look, I know I'm not treating the underlying brain condition. I'm not treating migraines. I'm not treating, but what I'm trying to do is um, modulate, mediate, somehow um, uh, reduce the triggers for these life events. And it worked. She had not had a single aura. Remember, she was having eight to 10 a week um, that were then moving to these, uh, most of them to some kind of negative sequela. So I made her two pairs because um, it's so hard to get the titration of the colors just right. I made a dark pair and a lighter pair. She wore the dark pair for those two weeks. She tried the lighter pair for one day, got a headache, went right back to the darker pair. So I, I knew which darkness lens uh, I needed to make for her. Now, just in case you thought everybody was uh, green or blue-green, um, this was a, um, a, a patient who came in um, who actually went to church with one of our faculty. And um, she'd started getting um, migraines and were getting progressively worse to the point that she was missing a lot of school. Um, and we finally made her contacts and they were very dark. They matched this purple color, which I think you can see here and you hopefully see the bifocal. They were also adding the appropriate plus and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, that's what she looked like. I, I'm gonna share with you these colored glasses. Um, again, maybe it's a negative uh, commentary on um, <laughs> life in the US, but even at SCO, when one of my students would wear these colors, other people were, well, why do you get to wear the colors? Oh, aren't you like Elton John? Or aren't you like this? And, and they get this sort of ribbing and this, and it's, so they become a focus of attention. Now, granted, this looks odd as well, but you, you only get this sort of glance from far away and you have to come up pretty close to see, ugh. Now, please know I always try the center only, but what happens is with a little bit of movement and, and the pupils dilate a little more under the dark because there's not as much light coming through. So as soon as I try the center only, uh, a lot of them don't like that. And we uh, uh, do go with the full uh, tinting uh, type of thing. I see a question in here. Uh, let's let's uh, bring that in. It says, is it all subjective response or do you do retinoscopy um, uh, and that type of thing? And um, uh, so Kira, uh, it's all subjective. I cannot tell a darn thing. I, I can do retinoscopy through it, but uh, it's not optics. Um, and I'm gonna get through how to actually do the testing. And again, you don't need a colorimeter. There's a new way to uh, do this and it's, it's free and open, and I'll, I'm gonna show you as we get to the end of this. So, so in her own words, she said, after trying multiple medications to try to lessen the amount of the side effects from her complicated migraines, we found no relief. Finally, I went to the optometrist, they gave me tinted glasses, and they stopped my complicated migraines completely. It's just wonderful to get those kind of emails. Now, this is another one, you really can't see the lenses up close, but these are dark, dark, dark red. Um, she uh, had, um, was working in a, a factory and uh, there had been a blast injury. Uh, and she's actually a vision therapy patient and we've done uh, a lot of work with her. Oh, as a quick aside, uh, Dr. Kitchener, I think is on this call. This is a shared patient between um, uh, Dr. Kitchener and myself, because uh, uh, she was in Cincinnati at the time. Uh, I think Cincinnati, but uh, he saw this one. Um, and uh, uh, she spent a year, more than that, uh, her husband was doing a fellowship. Um, uh, he's an ortho orthopedic surgeon uh, in the Memphis area. 
they're away right now. He's doing uh, the next step in his training, but they're coming back to Memphis. So um, I, I did a study on, on uh, all this color stuff. Look, I think those of us that do some of this kind of work, be it plus lenses, be it color, people tend to think, oh, uh, you know, you're biased and, um, uh, or think we, we all know the, the, the critique, right? If your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, meaning you're going to treat everything with color. And I wanted to get a sense, was this the Hawthorne effect? Um, because I believed in it, I communicated my belief, and I presented this, that this was going to do this, and it was my power of um, my personality that, that, that made these things happen, right? Hawthorne effect. Was it a placebo effect? Was my belief in this so strong that it can, I, I think you understand. So what we did um, was uh, we got an IRB and um, uh, we brought in a bunch of normals, um, people who had not had seizures, who didn't have migraines or who didn't have uh, traumatic brain injury. Okay. So that was who was supposed to respond. So we had a, 100 people, second, third year SEO students, all of whom thought they were normal, but we had a questionnaire and 21 of them actually said, oh, actually, I'd had either a mild TBI, a seizure, or a migraine. So we put them in the other group, okay? I also had nine more that I knew um, were TBI, seizure, or migraines. Uh, the numbers, somehow I got one more normal, but I ended up with 80 who were non migranors not, not seizure disorders, and who had never had a traumatic brain injury. And I had 30 with one or more of those other problems. And uh, yes, uh, uh, Kara, the, it's subjective. Uh, five point Likert scale, you put a color up, um, a minus two, I really don't like this color. Actually, when I'm testing a patient, I say, uh, this makes you want to punch me. <laughs> just it's so awful you can't stand the way the color is um, a plus two is ah I love this please don't turn it zero is a meh a neutral response and minus one I don't like it but it, I'm not pun I'm not in a punching mood plus one this is good but I was hoping for more okay so a five point Likert scale uh, as they work through um, the initial study was done with the colorimeter and in essence the colorimeter um, uh, protocols where there are 12 with zero saturation, meaning they're just standard balanced white light. And then there are 12 therapeutic colors. And you alternate um, the standard balanced neutral white light with the therapeutic color and you work around the dial. So uh, they rated all of these. And um, of the controls, 23 gave a two to some one of those 24 colors. 19 of those, uh, 19 of the 23, uh, their twos, I really like it, was in one of the neutral balanced uh, colors in the middle. It wasn't a color. Um, uh, and the bottom line was there were only two of the 80 that gave a response to a potential therapeutic color. And when I showed it to them in filters, they went, yeah, this would be an okay sunglass, but it doesn't really do anything for me. Do, do you understand? So potential therapeutic colors for people who don't need them, they don't select therapeutic colors. That was a very nice validation. Uh, um, but of the 30 with symptoms, eight or more picked very specific colors. Uh, six chose the funny one and 16 gave us pretty much uh, nothing. So these were the specific colors. And I, I'm just going to tell you from this point on, what I really learned, because people will, will either call me up or write me an email and say, what's the color for migraine? Or I see in the doc list, oh, I have a patient with, and somebody says, try this color. And I'm going to be honest with you, what I found was the color is very individualized for that person. It's not for the condition, it's for what the person needs. Um, so um, 
every time I see this, oh, this is the color for uh, migraines. This is the color for this. Um, the hairs in the back of my neck go up and I, I try not to write. Uh, it really needs to be personalized, but it really does need to be personalized. So I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, so the, I mentioned that the soft Chrome company folded and um, did a bunch of calling around and the next gen optical makes uh, spectra tint. Uh, this is a UK company. Uh, and this is now where I'm getting the tints and the dyes uh, that I use. Um, you, if you're going to do this, you should have a um, heat table uh, with a, um, uh, it's got a magnet inside it and a motor driven kind of thing because you need to stir it, you need to hold it at very specific uh, temperatures. Um, they have lots of different dyes. Um, what I will tell you is I actually very much liked the soft chrome system better, but it's not available anymore. With the soft chrome system, the dyes in the bottles were exactly what you ended up seeing. Um, so you, you could be more intuitive with, let me try three drops of this and two drops of this, and you could see what it would look like just in a, in a dish. Um, but with the um, spectra tint dyes, they don't look anything like this in their bottles. And sometimes the one that's going to turn red looks clear. Uh, I got a yellowish one in the bottle. That's the one that turns blue. They're not opposite colors. So I'm, I'm to get the first set of lenses for a person, uh, I'm having to go through a lot more lenses uh, until I figure out their actual formula. Um, once I do, highly, highly repeatable. Uh, and um, uh, SCO will be getting back to being open. I had my uh, COVID-19 testing today, uh, should hear Wednesday. I've already had my testing through another site and I know I'm fine and I don't have the antibodies. I was so hoping at a horrible, horrible cold in February, I was hoping that was it and that maybe I was gonna be resistant, but nope. Uh, so still got to be careful, but one of the first things I need to do when I get back to SCO is I've got a number of patients waiting for uh, some tinted lenses. So this is one of the first sets of the uh, Spectra Tint uh, system. Um, this uh, woman, um, uh, very, very severe symptomology, could not be in a standard lit room, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, made these lenses and she was able to basically return to mostly uh, a normal life, uh, which is nice. So what I wanna do is demonstrate this new system and let me tell you how, how this works and it is open um, when I give you, don't everybody go to the website at once because uh, I have no idea if it'll stay up or not if you all hammer it. Let me demonstrate it, okay? And then you can play with it uh, at your uh, leisure. So actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop my share. Well, maybe I can go directly to... All right, do you still see the slide or do you see... You do, okay, let me stop that. Okay, let's go to... Stop share. Stop share. Let's stop the PowerPoint presentation. Good. Smallerize that. Now, hello, Dr. Kitchener. <laughs> uh, let's put this on TCI. Zoom. Share screen, and this time we want to go here. Okay, so hopefully now what you have on the screen is it says therapeutic color indicator. Yes? Somebody? Yes. Okay, Ruth. Thank you, Ruth. Okay. What is that noise, Dr. Kitchener? Oh, that's your, your fan. It sounded like, it sounded <laughs> like you were... I was going to say, it sounded like you were sharpening a pencil. <laughs> okay. 
So, um, and is that readable, or do you need me to make this a little larger? I, it's a web, it's a it's a website, so I can should be able to uh, control plus, and you'll see it makes it larger or smaller. So the URL, and what I'll do is I'm going to copy and put it into uh, the chat, not to Colin, to everyone. Here we go. So again, please don't go to it right now. Copy and paste it. Um, but this is the therapeutic color indicator. And let me just share with you a um, Mark Taub got us in contact with a, a former resident who he knew um, her husband was a computer programmer and linked us together. And his name is Dima, D-I-M-A, May. Uh, and um, he programmed this. And it's gone through a bunch, a bunch of um, uh, variations. So a huge thank you to uh, Dima May. And his and my decision was to make this completely uh, free and open uh, to everybody's use. So there's, there's, you can use it. There's no cost involved. Uh, just use it. And there is a help uh, and there's a video uh, that you can watch to help you orient uh, on how to um, uh, use the site. So the choices that you have, <laughs> Grandpa's getting to see the baby, which is nice. I see too. Hello, Crosby. Okay. So the target, just like in the colorimeter, you could do just the color. And once you start the testing, the screen, um, um, you would have no target. I typically use text, not because I'm going to ask the person does the text look better or not? It just gives them something to look at. And if you want, you can go to nonsense stuff, but I, I use text. Now you have three different um, saturations, if you will. If you choose light, these are actually going to match the 30% settings um, on the intuitive colorimeter, okay? Um, it's going to give you the RGB values. Um, and I have a conversion table from the RGB values. If somebody has the cerium um, uh, filters and they want to make an equivalence to them, I can, I can give that to you. The medium matches their 50% numbers and the dark matches the 18 most popular Roscoe Lux filters that I found over the last 25 years of doing this color work um, uh, were beneficial to my patients. So right now what I'm going to do is run through how to use this with text and um, with the medium colors, okay? When you go start, and most likely the colors on your screen will not be the correct colors. You do need to have a calibrated screen. Uh, I can tell you if you do this on an iPad, uh, for the most part, you, you can pretty much take to the bank that the color that it shows on an iPad is going to be the correct color. Make sure you should make sure all the lights are off. There's no other light source being reflected on your screen. So this is just the, the target here. And essentially the person would tell us, I hate it. Um, you click on the minus two, which I did. And just to share with you between each color, you're gonna get a neutral gray. And the, I keep this up for five seconds. They do not need to rate this color. Um, this is simply to, um, let the after image of the prior color sort of fade and come out, okay? In essence, I didn't want the after image from that prior color overlapping with the other. And this follows the um, colorimeters protocol as well. Um, what's different here, which I like better, instead of going around the color wheel, the therapeutic colors are going to come up in random sequence. So I rate that as zero. And this is one of the other potential therapeutic colors. Maybe the person gives this a plus one, okay? Again, you would wait five seconds. I'm not going to take our time here to do that. Uh, maybe they say, oh, I like this one too. 
Ooh, I, I don't like this. I won't use the H word. Minus two. Okay. Oh, I don't like that. I'm just giving you some. This is a meh, right? Okay. Um, don't like. Then they go, oh my gosh. This is, this is the cat's meow, whatever. So they give it a plus two. I, I'm just making up a particular case. Ah, only a minus one. Oh, that's another one that's a plus two. So I'm going to let them give this one a two. And you just sort of go around. Uh, they rate them. And here's the key. So it's all subjective. If there was only one number two, it would be done at this point, And it would just show you that value. But I intentionally gave it two number twos. And if you have two or three number twos, it'll give you the chance to run a playoff and just go back and forth between those until they down rate, in this case, one of them, leaving one a two to, to pick one, okay? Uh, if there's four or more that are two, person's not very discriminating. I'd, I'd, I'd say, let's run it again. Try to not give anything you like a two, be more discriminating. And sometimes they'll give four of them a two again, and I just say, I don't think a therapeutic color is really going to be helpful for you, okay? Um, so let's run the playoff. This is one they gave a two. Um, this time, maybe they give this one a one. This one, they still like a two. Uh, and it comes back and says, their preferred filter, they looked at 13 different ones. They went through one playoff round. Their preferred filter, and it's showing the color here, is TCI, stands for Therapeutic Color Index number 21. I give you the RGB value of that, 34106128. Um, before I show you the preview, you can go down here, and it shows you their response to every one of the potential colors. And down at the bottom, it shows you what happened in the playoff round or playoff rounds. Um, you can uh, print this out, and then you can do uh, print is right here. And if I do a preview, it just shows you their potential therapeutic color um, so that they can verify this. Go back to close, and you're right back here. And if you wanted to run it again, you would hit start over. So therapeuticcolorindicator.com. This is free and open to use. Um, and I would, we would love you to, you know, give it a try. In Australia, if anybody's on from Australia or New Zealand, CRC Surfacing, uh, which is a wonderful um, uh, supporter and sponsor for uh, ACBO, all they need is this number. Um, I've given them the information they need, and they can reproduce these uh, tints uh, for you. At SCO, I have an incredible optician who's also an artist on the side. He has his own spectrometer, but he will work uh, and match these colors, and then he sends them over to me to verify based on my use of the spectrometer to make sure it matches um, before we send it out in uh, eyeglasses. If the glasses themselves help, um, I would consider them moving to the custom tinted soft contacts. And it is the Spectra Tint system by, um, I think you saw it was Next Gen Optical, uh, UK company, is the company that I've been using for that. So this is really what I wanted to present. I think at this point, I'm uh, open for uh, questions. Uh, Kira said, it would be an interesting study to discover if a home Syntonics program would be as effective. Do I ever do, I personally don't do Syntonics uh, myself. I am trained in it in my private practice. Um, I had uh, some of Simon Gravevsky's um, uh, home. He's from Australia. I had some of his home units that I specifically sent home with some of my pretty severe TBI patients to uh, help <laughs> activate them. They were ones sleeping 16, 18 hours a day, very, very lethargic. And um, uh, I used that in that instance. So I did not use it on a regular basis in my private practice. 
I was trained by the CSO and attended several CSO meetings. Uh, I've read um, a number of books, including the Syntonic Principle, et cetera. Uh, and uh, I'm going to leave any comments about um, using it or not using it at Southern College of Optometry. Uh, um, we're just going to leave that to the side. So, um, and yes, it would be. I don't know that this testing regimen is anything that would be used to to verify that. Um, um, I know Yosef's on the on the the call, and I know he does a good bit of uh, uh, syntonics and work with color. And uh, Yosef, um, you could unmute yourself if you want to, or maybe Colin has to unmute you. I don't know. Uh, here, I think I can unmute you. I, I'd be oh, interested thank in you. your comments, uh, yeah, Yosef. Oh, it's uh, very interesting. Thank you uh, for giving me the word. Uh, uh, as Kathy also said, uh, I think. Uh, uh, you can give filters or tints uh, either in glasses or in contact lenses and it uh, it, it would be um, uh, very very good to use it for a uh, immediate uh, a, a very fast help uh, syntonics is for me it's it's giving a, a longer help over maybe months or years that's what i can say and uh, Kathy Stern uh, is on and wrote, uh, I think there's room for both. I didn't say there wasn't. Uh, I just have only worked in the tinted lenses. And I, I've been working more in these acute types of conditions. People who are migranors uh, to try to act uh, to mitigate the triggers for their migraine. Uh, if in addition, uh, other treatments, which could include syntonics, might also help long-term treat the overall condition. That's wonderful, but I'm trying to mitigate the triggers for the migraines, for the seizures, and to help people deal with um, um, the issues secondary to concussion or traumatic brain injury. So um, absolutely um, um, not negative at all on syntonics, just it's, it's not a tool um, um, that's really available to me in my current position. Other questions? Anybody would like to comment? Yes, I don't it? think you, you shouldn't see uh, syntonics as uh, uh, it's not positive, it's not negative. Uh, it's, it's like you said, you, you, you can't always get the right color. Uh, sometimes you have to take the, 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 the opposite color to have it right. Exactly. Uh, that was my what I have for uh, for my um, experiences that I made, and uh, if uh, if I see what uh, Bill Padula did, he's doing a lot with filters and with prisms and with binasals. You know what he does. Yes, yes. And I was in his office uh, once, and and what I saw was a, it was amazing. And and we're talking about filters right now. Uh, uh, I think filters is, is one of our magic things we can do uh, with, uh, with what others can't do. Yeah. I, I, Joe, I love you, um, and, uh, I'll, I'll, but I'm, I'll critique one word, and that's magic. Um, I, I think I've been trying to spend my entire career to, to stop calling things magic, because if it's truly magic, I can't teach it, I can't share it. I want to try to find the science behind it. And I know what you mean by it is we have some very powerful tools and color is one of those. And the throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Look again, as I said, the people on this call, we can say syntonics. We know there's not going to be any knives flying in the air. Okay. Um, but that's not true in the general profession. Um, there are some very strongly held biases uh, against uh, the term and the word. And um, some of us have to work around uh, various things and, and that type of thing. Um, Kathy went on to say um, there's somewhat recent uh, uh, research. Uh, there's more flying and it's uh, moving up the screen. There's somewhat more recent research for green for migraine this company, blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm just going to say, Kathy, they could do their research with a particular color, but they're probably wrong. I'm just going to say it straight out. I just, I've worked with hundreds now, migranors, seizure disorder patients. 
there is no one color for, and I think every time people, I just hear, it's my personal bias, trying to shoehorn people into a particular color for a condition, that's not what we do. Behavioral optometry is really looking at people as people. What got them out of balance? What got them into their kind of situation? And let's look for how do we help get them back in balance or deal with what life is throwing at them. So just my opinion. Uh, Emily, thank you, very informative. You're welcome. Uh, uh, another one, after I put the tinted glasses, do I check on how they perceive the space? Oh, absolutely. Um, now, uh, 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 if some of you know, I'm the space board, uh, I won't call myself the space board king, but um, uh, absolutely. Can, are they moving through space comfortably? Are they, they're, what a lot of the patients, when they get the correct color, or we go through this diagnostic thing and I try it, uh, I don't prescribe just based on this number. I still get the, the lenses out and let them try it. They tell me almost immediately, my breathing is easier. I feel more relaxed. There's less tension. So they're simply more comfortable when the color goes on. And uh, yes, um, they may walk in in a very timid and, and, and they'll stride out sometimes uh, with the appropriate color on. So yes, I'm looking at how they uh, perceive the space. Uh, Ruth says, uh, I always find the colorimeter result is often too dark, so I tend to lighten it uh, and offer the handheld stack of lenses in the room. Usually add uh, uh, binasal occlusion as well. Uh, and, you know, that's wonderful, Ruth. Ruth, are you typically looking at the lighter uh, colors like the 30s? I've unmuted you if you want to speak. Uh, are you typically looking and doing the reading work or are you working with some of these more severe uh, patients? Probably the more severe. Anybody really who has migraines or uh, that sort of symptom. And it, as you say, it's very subjective. What does it feel like? How does it, what does it do to you? Uh, and you can, you can, the heart rate can quite often tell you what feels right. You can see the shoulders go down. Yes, they, absolutely. Well, I, uh, and, and that's a good thing that Ruth said. When I do the testing, I'm sitting next to the person and I look back at the person's face. And I can usually see if when I hit them with a negative two, they scrunch their face up, they shock backwards. And I can see when you hit them with a plus two. And I think, Ruth, you're almost saying the same kind of thing. It's just like you just see, you just see them relax. And it's just... So you can sort of read it. And that plays into Kira's uh, next uh, uh, thing. She says, well, I have some nonverbal kids and with seizures and I've ever worked with that. I've not worked with nonverbal with the color, but I, I do think if you have enough experience reading some of the posture and other stuff, you'd want to see that it's repeatable, um, but I would certainly give it a try. Um, I would certainly give it a try and just sort of see if you could read the posture and those kinds of things. And yes, um, uh, Ruth says you could measure uh, heartbeat, galvanic skin response, uh, other things uh, like that. Um, HRV, uh, uh, Kathy, uh, you're not on my screen, so I don't know what HRV stands for. Let me see if I can pop to the second screen, find you and unmute you, instead of you just having to be a typing wizardress. I, I, are you a phone number? No. Colin, do, do you see her? Heart rate variability. Heart rate variability. Okay, got it. She's <laughs> typing, but I don't actually see her on the on the thing. That's fine. Uh, at any rate, mystery person. Uh, that's good. Uh, heart rate variability. How would you measure? I, I, I'm just going to ask. Uh, how would you measure heart rate variability? Ruth? I don't, I don't measure it. Oh, you don't? No, I know. She was asking me, do I measure it? And I've just gone back and said, no, I don't. Okay. I, yeah. and, and I can't see her to unmute her. So I, I just, I don't know where you are, Kathy, but we're all good. Okay. Um, so any other questions? I mean, that's, that's really the presentation. Uh, please play with uh, the Therapeutic Color Indicator Program. Uh, and if you find a, co a, a therapeutic color number, RGB thing that helps somebody, if you do have 
um, the um, uh, cerium filters and you'd like to know which matches which, I'll be glad to uh, share those with you. Okay. Um, so I want to thank uh, Vivid Vision and the whole iHeartVT, uh, my moderator today, uh, Colin. I made your job, I guess, a little easy today. Uh, um, but uh, uh, these are fun. Uh, I, I, I love sharing. And this, this has been some work that's been um, uh, part of what's really interested me uh, is this work with color. Uh, and I, I hope you find it useful as well. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you all for joining Bye. us. I hope Bye. you have a, a good night. Unshare screen. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Here it is. Stop. All sharing. right. Thank you all. See you again soon. Bye-bye.